Hi everybody, Rob here. Uh, in this video I'm going to look at my process for painting goblins. Um, in particular this is going to be the Gloom Spike Gits uh, Loom Boss, the one standing on the mushrooms as you've probably seen in the thumbnail anyway. Um, so I'm not going to waffle on too much now, let's go straight to the painting desk and I'll talk you through how I approach painting this model, which is a kind of a mix of like old school and new school painting, uh, which I think really suits the goblins, but I'll discuss that as, as I paint. Cool, okay, see you at the end. So I've base coated this model with Periscopes by Vallejo. It's part of the Panzer Aces range. Um, it's one of my favorite colors. Uh, I use this paint a lot, especially on my goblins. Um, I tend to use it for various uses, um, but I use it a lot for base coating the skin, no matter what the skin's gonna end up like. So um, the Shroomancer was painted with this, but then highlighted up through turquoises. This one's going for a more traditional goblin color, which is green. Um, this is the Warboss green and I'm using as the, the main highlight. And I'm using a wet palette just to keep the, the paint consistency the way I like it, and moving around the model, trying to pay attention to the volumes, so where the, the, the fingers wrap around the, the handle of his weapon, um, they'll get darker as they kind of get underneath, so it's the upper surfaces that are being uh, more well lit by an overhead light, or the sun, or the sky, or whatever it would be, um, that are getting more of the highlights. Uh, and also just picking up some of the, the kind of the details, like the sharper edges. Uh, and I'm doing the same thing here for the, the calves and the, the, the shoulder muscles. And really this first highlight is more of a, uh, of a base coat than anything. This is kind of my mid-tone, um, with the periscopes just left in the, the deepest recesses. So adding a little bit more of the, the Warboss green here. Uh, you can see I'm just working around, adding more definition to the highlights and just using a, a, a smaller highlight for each each pass that I do. And I think I did four passes in, in total for this. Um, and then one more with a, a little ivory added just to really make those highlights punch on the kind of the sharpest edges of the knuckles, that sort of thing. I also went in and did the eyes. So this model has a separate face, which is a separate component of the, of the model when you're building it. And I did debate whether I should paint it separately and then glue the, the helmet on over the top. But in the end, I thought actually I could just paint them uh, and be careful uh, as I paint the helmet later on. I wouldn't want to paint the helmet, which is gonna be yellow. So a nightmare to fix any mistakes. Um, I did leave the ears at this point for that very reason. Uh, so the, the helmet's gonna be uh, bright yellow or fairly bright yellow. Um, and I didn't want to then you know, have to work around the ears I thought it'd be much easier to paint them afterwards so I'm just dotting the eyes here this is a little bit of uh, screamer pink and some ivory as a, a dot highlight uh, they're barely visible in the model uh, you could probably do without doing them but I, for completion's sake I wanted to so then I move on to base coating the metal and here I'm using I use uh, Vallejo model uh, metal color I think it's called I can't remember the names of the individual paints, but I use three. I use a dark one, a mid-tone, and then a... Well, the mid-tone is called Dura Aluminium, and the highlight is just white silver or something like that. Um, and I start off base coating in the, the darker one, and I paint the whole lot. And I paint this in a very similar way. Um, and as I'm painting this, I'm doing it with the idea that I'm painting it as kind of like a fairly new shiny metal and then I'll dull it down with inks and glazes and things afterwards. Uh, I prefer doing it that way rather than any other, uh, especially for goblins. Uh, it lets me kind of dull down the metal, which is quite important for the look I'm going for. It's a, a great paint. Uh, I love these Vallejo metal color paints. They're, they go on really, really smoothly. Um, they don't kind of stodge up and crust up like some other brands uh, can do if they're, they're left too long. And because I don't like using metals on a wet palette they just spread out and you know contaminate everything else um, they don't go through the sponge which is something some people worry about but I'm not worried about that I'm more worried about flex getting into other colors that I want to use later on anyway here I'm going in with dual aluminium and I'm picking out the edges of panels and some of the broader panels where they're facing more upwards um, I'm adding a much bigger highlight the end result's going to have quite a dark downward facing surface so the the shadows are going to be pretty non-shiny they're going to have quite a matte matte finish in fact the whole thing is going to be finished with a, 
a matte varnish um, with a extra edge highlight of the metals picked out afterwards just for that extra sheen. Uh, but here you can see where I'm just kind of following the shapes of the model and not worrying too much about the recesses at this point because like I say I'm going to go in with some inks afterwards to cover those. I go for fairly scratchy highlights as I'm working on goblins uh, and some other models as well. Um, I, I like the, the little extra bit of texture you get. And for this one I painted the, the weapon in the same way. Um, I added some kind of lines around the, the cutting edge of the blade just to make it appear a bit more used. And, and that is something you can do at this stage rather than waiting for the, the inks. One thing to keep in mind with these Vallejo metal colour paints is that there's a some kind of like quite strong capillary action so when you dip the brush into the, the, the palette to pick up some paint it really sucks up quite a lot so make sure that you uh, you're, you're aware of that and you can get rid of the excess and this is a much bigger effect with these paints than you would get with a certain other colours. Here you can see me with the, the white avalanche just picking out the, the, the kind of very edges and some of the crisper details of the metal parts. So while this is edge highlighting, it's not the kind of same kind of edge highlighting as you might do on a, a Space Marine or something kind of clean and crisp like that. Although these, these shapes are quite clean, um, I wanted to end up with a, an element of kind of like driminess and use and slightly dilapidated. The same same applies to the weapon. Um, I'm adding a, a broad highlight on the upward facing area. Now I don't worry too much about adding contrast across this surface, uh, although I do a little bit there. So you can see there that I'm you know doing some edge highlighting um, and picking out some of the broader forms, but I'm actually gonna add in a lot of that detail later with inks. I do like to pick out the, the edges and certain parts of the area and you can see I'm not doing a, a complete smooth single coat. Um, I am leaving some areas dark but really I'm leaving this for a later stage. This is more about setting values for the, the overall look of the weapon.
So here I'm doing kind of my my second part of the the metal processor, and this is a mix of Agrax Earthshade and uh, Null Oil by Citadel. Uh, and this is a pretty much a 50/50 mix thereabouts. And this works for two tasks in kind of one hit, um, and that's it helps define the the forms um, and edges. So it kind of works as a really good recess shade, but it also dulls down some of the brightness of the metal which I really wanted to happen that was quite important for this particular model um, and gives that kind of tarnished metal look all at the same time uh, and if you work against the edges of details I find that can work quite well so you can do like a, a filter over the top almost like a glaze um, and then you can brush against the so if you look here on the foot if I brush against the detail rather than along it then I get really nice definition across the kind of the joints between the metal parts uh, but I'm getting the, the the warmth of that brown coming through and it's dulling down some of that brightness because obviously a, a gobbo like this is not going to have bright shiny armor When it comes to the weapon, I do the same kind of thing. I do a filter the same as I was explaining before, which is almost like a glaze, but then I I make sure that there's more of the, the wash in certain areas, and I build this up in three or four layers uh, to really accentuate some of those shapes and to dull down certain parts of the, the blade, the same as the armor. Uh, and you, you have to be quite, quite kind of intentional about how you place it and don't put on so much that it starts to pull you want it to stay in place without running somewhere you don't want it uh, which can be tricky with you know such thin consistency but you can see that it's been placed kind of in the middle of flatter areas uh, which helps the edges stand out so you get that contrast but also it, it adds to the kind of the dirtiness I actually do quite a few layers on the bottom two or three panels on his back armour because I really want them dulled down to being very nearly black at the end of the process. You can see I'm almost kind of stippling the, the, the wash on at this point uh, and that's because I'm using it less as a wash and more as just a very very thin shadow uh, and it works really well, it works really nicely. One of the benefits of this approach is that especially for, for army models that are going to be on the tabletop uh, it's a lot quicker, it's a lot more efficient um, and an awful lot easier than doing non-metallic metals uh, which can look fantastic when done right but it takes a while and you're looking at a lot of blending and feathering and so on whereas here I'm just doing you know three or four applications of, a, of an ink or a wash. I'd also run a, a line of this between any armor and skin or other, other materials on the model. I think in this case it is mostly skin. Uh, that just, it's not black lining as such because it's not really black, it's a, a darker color and it dulls down quite a lot, um, but it adds that contrast and definition that is all important at this scale. So 
So the helmet on this model is going to be a fairly bright yellow. Uh, and painting yellow over a black undercoat is always troublesome. So here I'm going in with a fairly light uh, grey-white from Vallejo. Uh, just to, to aid in that process of getting a decent base coat down. And the base coat I am applying here is Avalon Sunset from Citadel. Uh, it's a good, strong yellow, goes on with just a couple of coats, even over this kind of fairly pale uh, primer, I guess I use that as a primer, and um, that grey-white. Um, you still do need a couple of thin coats. Otherwise, you, you you kind of risk obliterating some of the detail, which you really don't want to do. So I'm just finishing off a second coat here, and then it's ready for highlighting. Now, I treat this as a base coat, and the actual, the next layer I do um, is using, I forget the name of the colour, but it's a Vallejo Air colour. Uh, I think it's an air colour. No, it's a game colour, and it's a kind of a zesty yellow. Um, which I mix into the Avaland, and I use this on probably 70% of the, the the face or the helmet, um, just to add some total variation. Now oh, there you go, you can see it there. Uh, and I think we all know that painting faces with some tonal variation adds a lot of life to them. Um, but the same can be said for other areas of models as well. So a helmet can work just the same. So for this case, I'm using this kind of slightly more lemony yellow. Um, to do that uh, and this is really the mid-tones rather than the highlight so I would say this is yeah 70% of the model of the, of the helmet's gonna get covered in this uh, and I, I just like the fact that it adds a little bit of brightness and life before I go in and start adding highlights Now this paint has quite a low opacity, so it takes a little bit of time to build up. I think I did maybe two or three layers of this, uh, just creating the, the, the kind of effect I wanted. Now the benefit of having a lower opacity is you can use it almost as a, a blending tool in itself by each subsequent layer not being, uh, not, not covering quite as much as the previous. So on larger, flatter areas, you can, you know, do 70% coverage and then do 60 then 50 so on so forth like that and uh, that helps you get some smoother blends now here I'm using a, a, a like an ochre color mixed with a tiny bit of the original yellow quite thin down to a, a real thin glaze you can see on my wet palette there that it's, it's pretty transparent and I use this for shading um, for yellows especially this is a, a good way of doing it because it's it's not so strong that you're gonna completely cover up that yellow and for here I'm doing all the downward facing areas uh, in a more volumetric way and then I'm also doing a, a kind of a pin lining way around details like the teeth and the, the joint areas. And again this is just for readability, it helps having this kind of contrast on the face it really aids readability. Uh, and you can, using a, a thin enough glaze like this, you can build up some really nice smooth transitions from one area to another. Something I really like about the sculpt of this model is it's got quite a lot of kind of edges and lines that you might not at first see. In fact, you see it more uh, as I come on to do the highlights, I'll be adding some ivory, which is kind of my global highlight color for this model. Um, and you can see that I pick out some of those lines that at the moment you can't actually see. For that shade colour I actually went in and I did maybe two or three extra layers around key details like the the, the teeth well, not teeth, because it's a helmet, but you know what I mean. Uh, and around the rivets and the, the joint areas. I just really wanted to push that contrast.
This is where I'm, I'm really starting to push the brightness of the highlights. And this is a mix of Avalon Sun and uh, the ivory that I mentioned. That's a, a Vallejo paint. And what I'm doing is I'm doing some some transitions over the upward facing surfaces, picking out the edges of those kind of like, I guess it's the, the hammered metal of the, the helmet um, and key details like teeth and rivets and uh, around the eye socket uh, and along the top of the nose. And then as I mentioned before, now is the time to go in and paint the ears without worrying about destroying anything else that you've done. Uh, I think this is just a, a smart way of doing it. Maybe people with a steadier hand than me could have gone in and done that beforehand, but I just felt this was easier. Now the emblem on the, the end of the weapon, I thought I'd keep in the same color scheme as the helmet. Uh, it's quite a busy model, there's a lot going on. When you look at all the different mushrooms and things growing out of his armour and that he's standing on, uh, you could end up with a lot of colours which I wanted to avoid. I prefer a simpler colour scheme. Um, and it just keeps it easier to read uh, and I think looks a bit more cohesive. Uh, this is the exact same uh, colours that I was using on the helmet. Same recipe and everything. Um, same ivory highlights, trying to concentrate on the upper facing surfaces. Now, I base coated all of the mushroom stalks and stems and base parts in Bugman's Glow. Um, I wanted to keep a, a fairly unified approach, again, for the same reason that it's uh, quite a busy model, there's a lot to look at. And I didn't want the, all the mushrooms to have too many different colours and distract from the, the goblin himself. Uh, he's obviously the, the key focus and the helmet is the key focus, so if I had too much going on, there would be a lot of colour contrast. Uh, as well as you know value contrast which I really wanted to avoid um, so I used one color for the whole lot and I'm highlighting the Bugman's glow with uh, duck egg which is a Vallejo air color uh, it's a really nice color and this just adds uh, just a, a little bit of tonal variation um, some color contrast is always nice but like I say I wanted to keep it subtle for this particular model or this area of the model anyway I didn't worry too much about the, the ground aspect of this model, even though it's got some sculpted detail, uh, because I know that I was going to cover this up with my basing materials. Um, so I, I go into the, that section a little bit when I add uh, my second kind of layer of shade in a minute, um, but I'm not worried about painting any details there at all. Exactly the same process on the reverse, and who knew that who knew that mushrooms had butts? Anyway, the same kind of highlighting process. Uh, and when it came to the little eye stalks on that mushroom with the two eyes, um, I they're, they're kind of the sculpt is quite smooth. There's not really a lot of detail going on there, which is fine because they're tiny. Um, but I decided to paint in some kind of highlights to indicate that there might be some ridges. So you can see when I get to that, um, I start painting little lines across uh, only on the upward facing bits just to kind of indicate that they're there uh, which I think worked quite nicely it's a tiny thing but that sort of thing pleased me
So when it came to shading this area, I used a, a thinned down ochre. The same ochre that I used on the helmet and the emblem on his weapon. Uh, again, for cohesiveness and just, I like those kind of global shadow ideas. Um, that ties in quite nicely to the uh, brown that I used in shading the metal as well. Now, I go in, there's some quite quite stark detail on this. Uh, so between the kind of lower and upper sections of the stalks, I went in and I, I applied it quite heavily there. Uh, and then just went into the ridges between certain parts of the mushrooms just to help define those shapes a little bit better. Also shaded the eye sockets here and that's just to help me kind of visualize them while I carried on painting the rest of the model because at this point I wasn't quite sure how I was going to approach the eyes. Now I'm adding a bit of tonal variation here using that periscope's color again that kind of really deep teal blue um, and I thinned it down loads into a kind of glazed consistency and I'm just using it half as a wash around the very darkest recesses right, recesses, uh, and also just dragging some down for maybe the lower 20% of the model uh, just to add just that tonal change uh, which I think worked really nicely uh, it just stopped the kind of swathes of fleshy colour looking overpowering and boring I wanted to have that little extra detail in there just to add some interest so onto the mushrooms started off with Screamer Pink from Citadel, which is a, a, a lovely base for a red. Um, and when I'm using things like periscopes as a, a shadow colour in certain areas, having Screamer Pink as a base coat for red uh, works quite well because it's got that kind of hint of blue in it anyway. Now for the red, I'm using Vallejo's Transparent Red, which as you can imagine is not particularly strong when it comes to opacity. Uh, which means you can build it up in layers and really very easily define where you want the strength to be. So in this case that's on the, the more upward facing surfaces, uh, leaving Screamer Pink showing underneath. Um, and that just automatically kind of shades. I did this in probably three or four layers with a final very top section done with um, Vallejo Flat Red. There are still quite a few details left on this mushroom so having the the overall form highlighted in that way uh, is fine but you couldn't really stop there i needed to capture all the, all the details of these little bulbous bits around the the edge and also up towards the point of the mushroom it needed you know just a little extra push so here i'm using cadian flesh tone mixed with that transparent red and you've got to be quite careful with it because cadian flesh is you know, a lot stronger in opacity than the transparent red so make sure you get your mixes nice and thin and not too much of the the flesh tone and i did this in maybe three layers and on the final layer i just pushed the the, the highlights at the very edge uh, with a little bit of ivory first firstly for that kind of extra pop and um, that i really wanted and secondly to introduce that ivory color um, which is kind of my global highlight color for pretty much everything except the, the metal parts.
For the spots, I'm using Vallejo Grey White. Uh, I do two passes on this because, again, it's not a particularly saturated paint. Well, saturated is the wrong word. It's not a particularly opaque paint. Uh, so that needed two go overs just to make sure I got them looking nice and crisp and clear and clean. Uh, some of the bigger spots I did add a, a tiny highlight just using pure white, um, but you could very easily do without that. I don't think it's particularly noticeable. And then this first mushroom with the face on, um, I'm just going over, I, I hadn't been quite sure at this point what I was going to do with it, so I left some of it black. Um, but here I'm going in with uh, Bugman's Glow again, just applying that base coat. And what I go for in the end is a kind of a, a fade from that base coat up to a lavender using Demonette Hide. Uh, and just blending my way up to the top of the, the mushroom with the Demonette Hide. I do that in kind of glaze form in maybe three passes I think I do for this. Uh, I do add a little bit around the face as well. Um, and I keep it quite subtle. Uh, again, for the reasons I gave before, I don't want too many colors on the bottom pulling the focus away from the, the, the goblin. Because the base is actually, you know, it's getting on for half of the model really. Uh, it's quite a chunky base with lots of detail. Um, and it's lovely, it's all good detail and it's fun and it's got that kind of whimsicalness um, that I really like from goblins uh, and I'm glad that the gloom spike gets the uh, incarnation of goblins has that still uh, something that I really appreciate and I liked it from you know back when I was a teenager and uh, you know goblins and orcs were drawn by people like Paul Bonner and they just imbued so much personality into them they were they were funny as well as brutal uh, and this model really kind of incorporates all those elements that I love Here I'm just pushing the highlights of the, the mushroom's face just to increase the contrast a little bit and make the face a bit more visible while not becoming too overpowering uh, and drawing too much attention. And painting with a painting handle uh, is a massive benefit uh, for this kind of work. I never used to use one. It was only the last few years that I've really used one. I used to just hold the edge of the base. I don't know how I ever did it. I don't know how I <laughs> how I ever managed to paint all the details on a model like that. Um, but being able to hang it upside down and so on is a, a, a godsend. So sticking with the limited palette theme, um, I used uh, another kind of a deeper lavender to paint the, this other mushroom. And then I used Demonette Hide to highlight it and I did the highlighting in a few passes I did one that you're seeing now which is quite a, a, a wide broad highlighting pass and um, just leaving the original base coat in the, the deepest recesses uh, and rather than painting it this coat first and then painting in the shades uh, it's the, the reason I didn't do that is just because this paint doesn't cover over black so well and then I come in and this is the one part of the model that doesn't have a huge amount of sculpted detail and I wanted to have kind of lines just adding a bit of detail so it's almost like corrugations in the top of the mushroom so I started painting in those lines myself uh, and I accentuated those as I highlighted and each pass just gave a little bit of extra depth to them so none of those details are sculpted in though I think there are like four splits in that mushroom head uh, the rest is all paint Now my gloom spike gits have a, a running theme, so I have all of these kind of like smaller pointy mushrooms painted in this blue and they fade to black at the top and they have the, the brighter highlights around the little kind of nodules and things around the edge of the mushroom. And that was done just with this blue colour, uh, I think it was Calador blue I think it's called, uh, with ivory added for the highlights and I did I think three or four passes of highlights. Once the highlights were done, I just used a, a plain black uh, in glaze kind of consistency uh, and just blended that up in probably three passes uh, just to, to get the, the tops pitch black right at the tips. 
uh, and that's something that I've carried through across my army. At this point I realised that those mushrooms, they were, they were catching the light. Every time I moved the model around they were just distracting me so I got out the Ultramat varnish from AK Interactive and I just did a quick brush coat of that matte varnish over the mushrooms uh, and that, that really helped. Uh, I do this quite a lot when I'm painting so I prefer a matte finish on my paints or on the finished paint jobs at least and uh, lots of paints have a kind of a satin look um, and this helped. You can already see there this is the, the next stage where I'm base coating the weapons handle that the mushrooms now look. You, the, the highlights you're seeing are the ones that I've painted on rather than anything coming from the environment around me. There's no kind of like specular highlights picking, picking up the, the painting lamps. So here I'm using a dark brown and a little bit of ivory mixed in to start highlighting that handle. And here again, same as the helmet, there are a few ridges uh, sculpted into the model. So I'm doing a mix of picking out those edges and changing the values of certain faces, especially the, the upward facing faces. Um, and the main one which is kind of facing the, the, the viewer's angle um, which I added that kind of brighter highlight to uh, just to accentuate the shape a little bit. I went for a really simple turquoise for those eyes on the mushrooms on both the one I'm painting now with the, the kind of stalks, the eye stalks and the the mushroom with the little face and the highlight for these was really basic just a bit of ivory added into that blue green uh, and I painted uh, just a very small arch across the top of those eyeballs. Uh, I didn't want to paint them up in that kind of gem style that you, you might see other way in like in other places. Um, I didn't want to draw attention to them too much. Okay so we're almost there, we're almost at the end point so I'm using some Vallejo Diorama I can't remember what it's actually called, but a diorama paste maybe. And I'm applying this just with an old brush. It's water-based acrylic with basically a bit of glue and sand in it, I think. Um, and then before that's dried, I'm just taking some slate. Uh, and this is the, the basing method for all of my glue and spike gits. Um, so I want them all to match. Some I use massive pieces of, of slate and have the model glued on top. Uh, which I think helps with a, a an army made of such small models like goblins um, and here I just wanted to match even though he's got a big base of his own and then I use more of that diorama paste just to kind of hold those tiny bits of stone in place um, and I actually left it overnight but this stuff glues like concrete it's amazing um, you don't need to super glue the stones down first or anything uh, and there's an another couple on the back just to help it all sit together and then to paint this, you could just dry brush that, uh, the diorama paste as it is if you wanted, because it's a, a really opaque pigment they've used in it. Um, but I need it darker to match the rest of my models. So here I'm taking the same dark brown as the base of the weapon, um, thin down quite a lot so that some of the, the diorama paste will show through a little bit. Uh, so almost like a just a thick wash. And then I'm going over all of that diorama paste uh, with the dark brown, um, trying to avoid the slate. Just going in again with a finer brush just to get into the, the, the fiddly bits. And then I let that dry for a bit and then came back and I dry brushed the whole base including the slate using Carrick Stone. Uh, I tried to be a little bit intentional about how I, I do this. Um, and you can see it looks a mess, but as soon as you start using that same brown colour to neaten up the edge of the base, and you know all bases should be edged, I think they just look better. Uh, a model's not finished without it, in my opinion, um, and uh, it's all starting to come together. So at this point, I whip out the airbrush. This is a Harder and Steamback Infinity CR Plus, and I'm using this just to do a couple of coats of matte varnish. Um, just to give everything a consistent finish. Now the only problem with that is that it also dulls down the metals. Uh, I think I mentioned this already earlier on. So I come back with Vallejo metal colour um, dual aluminium and just a fine brush and I just pick out all the rivets and do a, a fresh edge highlight around the upward facing edges of all of the metalwork. Uh, and this just brings back the 
pop and shine and contrast and helps everything just retain a, a, a bit of that metal feel but without the, the whole model being a mix of different finishes which I really don't like. Now I did make a mistake here I was holding the model by the base you can see I've got my thumb on the base um, and that ripped up uh, a little bit of the, the varnish that I'd sprayed over the top uh, and I don't cover it here but you'll see in the end photo that I did go back and tidy that up. So once all of the, the metal's been edge highlighted again like this and all those rivets have been picked out, I go in and I take some 6mm and 2mm static grass tufts um, and I'd already looked at these to decide where I wanted to put them before I put the stones down. And um, I just, you, know, you don't need any glue or anything, they're self-adhesive, just a pair of tweezers to pick them off the, the sheet and place them where I want them. Um, and then that's the, the whole job finished. Like I say, I did go back in and tidy up the edge of that base, uh, but the, the static grass is the last element. And I think this one came out looking really nice. I, I'm very pleased with the results. Uh, it was quite a quick paint job, although this video has been maybe longer than it needed. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, that's the model finished. And um, I hope this has been of some use. I hope that you've maybe learned something. Uh, if you've got any questions about any of the things I used uh, or questions about my process, uh, do let me know in the comments below and please do like and subscribe. Uh, it means the world to me. It really helps me out with my channel. Um, just for gear, uh, if there's anything you want to know, have a look on my website. There's a link in the description um, which talks about the gear I use and there's some affiliate links there as well so you can get a discount when you're shopping for your own stuff, which will save you some money and give me a little kickback, which is always welcome. Thanks very much. I've been Rob. See you soon.